We've been in a series called The Significance of the Sacred, and uh, we've looked at several things so far. We've seen that when understood, some of the difficult stories in the Bible, they actually teach us some very important life lessons. Like we saw with Uzzah when he touched the ark, it teaches us that good intentions aren't good enough. That good intentions are one thing, but we have to turn good intentions into actions. We, we saw in Samson's life that playing with the sacred gets us in trouble. We don't want to do that. We want to honor the sacred, not touch it. We looked at the ark going into battle, that, that that wasn't a good idea to use sacred things for our own advantage. And last week we looked, at, uh, we looked at marriage and saw that it was sacred, and it is sacred. It's something that God established as a God idea. This morning we want to look at another uh, interesting story. Uh, difficult story, if you will, from Genesis chapter 1. You can turn this monitor down. I think I'm getting some feedback on that thing. Um, Genesis chapter 1. It's one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. I have spent probably, I don't know, I'm, I'm guessing. I spent hundreds of hours studying Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and 3. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a part of my studies throughout my whole, my whole life. It's a great, great story, but there's a lot of misconceptions about Genesis chapter 1. Uh, one of the first ones is that Genesis chapter 1 is about creation and how God created the earth. Because in actuality, can you hear me? I'm struggling, guys. I, I, are we okay? All right, thank you. Um, in actuality, Genesis chapter 1 really isn't about creation. Now, I got everybody's attention now, right? Anybody who's read it and said, okay, wh where is he coming from? It's really about the Creator. I mean, we get wrapped up in debates and arguments about how Genesis 1 is supposed to be understood, and, and I'm ready to debate and argue on those points. I have done, but I'm not going to do that this morning because I have opinions too. But, but we can very easily miss the point that's being made in Genesis chapter 1, which there is a creator. There is a God that, speak, that, that was here before everything was created, that there is a God. In fact, if you read the, the first chapter of Genesis you'll find that the word God, which is Elohim in the Hebrew, is actually used 32 times. The word He, referring to God, is used six times. The word I is used two times. The word Our is used two times. The word Us is used once. So 43 times God is referenced in chapter 1 of Genesis. Now let me ask you a question. If I wrote you a letter and I used the name Bob 43 times in a letter... Who do you think the letter's about? It's about Bob. You've seen the movie, What About Bob? It's about Bob. Why is this important? This is important because our view of ourselves, our self-image, and we'll have more to say about this next week, but our self-image will flow out of our God image. Who we think God is or isn't, if there is a God or isn't a God, will determine how we see ourselves and ultimately determine how we live our lives. When I was 20, a long time ago, when I was 20, I used to be a little insecure. How about you? I used to worry, some of you insecure in 20 years of age, thank God we're not 20 anymore, but I was a little insecure and I worried about what people thought of me. And what people were thinking of me. Did you? You know, you worry about what they're thinking. At 30, however, by the time I was 30, I had been married for five years. And this whole insecurity thing was getting burned out because I had to grow up. At, at 30 years of age, I really didn't care what people were thinking about me. And then when I turned 40, I realized they weren't thinking about me. <laughs> Self-image. Self-image, how we think of ourselves, how we feel about ourselves, flows out of who we believe God is. Listen to the words of Henry Grunwald, former editor of Time Magazine. Now, the Time Magazine is not a Christian charisma. It's not a Christian magazine at all. Listen to what he says. He says, one of the most remarkable things about the 20th century, more than technological progress and physical violence has been the deconstruction of man and woman. In a century so often noted for its remarkable human achievement, which we did achieve a lot of things in the 20th century, humans themselves didn't fare so well. Instead, the relentless pursuit of progress, driven by secular ideologies, brought wars, ethnic cleansing, 
and human bloodshed on a previously unimaginable scale. This is Time magazine. I can, I can you know, understand, I've read things like this from Christian magazines, but this is not a Christian. This is a man in Time magazine who's not a believer. He goes on to say why. Runwald says, our view of man obviously depends on our view of God. You hear it? Let me say that again. This is no Christian. This is Time magazine. Our view of man obviously depends on our view of God. The ultimate irony, perhaps the tragedy, is that secularism has not led to humanism. Humanism being man is the measure of all things. He says, we have gradually dissolved, deconstructed the human being into a bundle of reflexes, impulses, neuroses, I think that's pronouncing it right, and nerve endings. The great religious, this is Time Magazine, mind you. The great religious heresy used to be making man the measure of all things. But we have come close to making man the measure of nothing. The 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche said, God is dead, we've killed him. Is it any wonder that the 20th century was the most bloodiest century in the history of mankind? We're being offered today, and when we go outside these doors, you're going to be offered all kinds of ideas and thoughts about who God is, who He isn't. But remember, the root is revealed in the fruit. We need to know our history. We need to know what's going on in our world around us. We need to know what's been going on and what has produced some of the fruits that we see. In the 20th century, 180 million people were killed by their own governments. Those governments were based on secular ideologies and the rejection of the existence of God. Why? Because our view of ourselves is determined by our view of God and how we will treat one another and how we'll relate to one another will flow out of our self-image. And so it's very important for us to understand who God is so that we can figure out who we are. We're living at a time where people are confused about our identity. Identity has become mainstream, a mainstream debate in our culture. And the reason it's confusing and people don't know who they are is we don't know who God is or we don't believe there is a God. And this is very similar to what happened in the Bible when Genesis was written. When Genesis 1 was written, we need to remember the context. In Genesis, Genesis 1 was written when Moses had just taken the children of Israel out of Egypt. They had been in bondage in Egypt for 430 years. For 430 years, they had learned the wrong ideas about God. They had embraced the religion of the Egyptians. They worshipped idols. They were living there for 430 years. And when God brings them out of Egypt by a mighty hand, by Moses, God calls Moses up to the mountain for 40 days where he receives the tablets and he receives the word of God. And Moses writes down the story of where man came from and the story of Genesis 1 and how God created man. Why? Because God understood that the image that Israel would have of themselves would come from their image of God or the gods, and God wanted to set the story straight. He wanted them to understand who He was and who He is so they could understand who they are. They were slaves. They were slaves in Egypt. And the theology of Egypt was consistent, as I'll show you here, was consistent with them being slaves. In other words, their theology taught them they were slaves, and therefore they accepted the fact that they're slaves. But when God sends, sets the record straight, He says, you are not slaves, you are sons. And what God is trying to do for Israel at Mount Sinai, at Mount Sinai when He gives them the law, and He gives them the Ten Commandments, and when He writes down the book of Genesis, is God's trying to get them to see that they are not slaves of the gods, They are sons of the one and true living God. They had learned Egyptian theology. Egyptian theology, you might might want to get your pen out today. I could pontificate on this for hours, but I won't. I'm going to keep you no more than three hours, and we'll get out of here by by mid-lunch. Now, I get excited about this because I spent a lot of time studying this. Not so much to tell you, but to me to discover for myself, what do I really believe? 
Egyptian theology really focused on three things. And this is what they would have learned. In fact, all three of these things will be addressed in Genesis chapter 1. Number one, matter is eternal. Matter is eternal. They believed all creation stories, if you study the creation stories and myths that perpetuate at the time of Moses and Israel, you'll find that all the creation story accounts start with pre-existing material, whether primeval waters or some kind of thing that was already there. Even the gods come out of this stuff. That's the first thing. You might want to write that down because do we believe today that matter is eternal? Hold on. Please hold on. I know this is a little bit teachy, but I, I, this is so important for us to get a hold of. Number two, they taught that there are many gods, and they organized and ran the world. And so when they looked at the sun and the moon and the stars, they believed they were gods that were running and organizing the world. Now, they didn't micromanage the world, but they were kind of involved. So they worshiped these gods because they were trying to get these gods to do things for them. And number three, which is the big one, the world was set up. It was created to serve the needs of the gods. Now, if matter is eternal, and the gods came out of it, and the gods run the world, and the world is made for the needs of the God, what does it make Israel? Remember, he's talking to the Israelites. Three million, excuse me, Israelites are at the bottom of the mountain, and God's telling them the history of the world. He's telling them where they came from so they could get the right image of themselves. And they had learned for 430 years that the gods are the one that created everything out of this primeval slime that existed forever. And the gods organize and run everything. Guess what that makes them? It makes them slaves of the gods. And Pharaoh in Egypt was considered a god. The Nile was considered a god. The frogs that came up on the, on the land was considered a god. The lice was considered a god. The cows were considered god. And when you study the story, what God did was he came in and he showed Israel directly and he showed Egypt that he's running the show, not the gods. But here's the thing that is germane or for us today. Their theology became their lifestyle. What they believed about God ultimately affected how they saw themselves, and how they saw themselves actually led to them living out the theology that they held, and the theology they held was that they were slaves. And so God comes on the scene. He delivers them from this slavery. He sets up many things that we could spend time on this morning, but we won't. And what he was really doing was revealing himself to them so they could understand who they are. Folks, we have an identity crisis growing in America. People don't know who they are anymore because we don't know who he is. And so when God introduces himself at Mount Sinai, it's like him stretching out his hand. You know, when you meet somebody, what do you do? Come here. Hi. Hi. I'm, I'm God. That's what God was doing. Now, you might want to make sure you translate that right. God was shaking. He was stepping. See how I'm up on the high place and, 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 and I reached down. That's what God was doing. Hi, I'm God. Now, let me explain who I am. And so, he says three things. There's a lot of things, man. There's books written on Genesis. Well, I've read a lot of them. There, there's whole books, volumes written on Genesis chapter 1. But there's three of the most important things you'll ever get out of this chapter. Number one, are you ready? Number one, are you ready? i got to remember what I was written down on my paper. I remember. I'm just trying to make sure I'm staying on my notes. Let's read Genesis 1. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Genesis 1. Verse 1, I'm only going to read a few verses out of this chapter. Go read the rest yourself, but I'm going to explain what's happening. Number one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth, they're a Hebrew way of saying everything. Everything that was made. Number one thing that God's saying is God made all the stuff. All the stuff you see, God made. 
There's nothing that's made that wasn't made by him. John says this in John chapter 1. He says everything was made by him. And nothing was made that was made wasn't made by him. God made everything. This would be huge to the Israelites. This would be huge to the, the Egyptians. This would be counterculture because they had learned all these years that matter is preexistent, that matter is eternal, and that the gods come out of that. And God's saying, I predate everything. In the beginning could be better translated before there was a beginning, I was there. And I was there in the beginning when stuff was made. I made it. I created it. Francis Bacon, the famous scientist who helped create the actual scientific method that we use today, said a little science is strange as a man from God. In other words, a little bit of science, if you have a little bit of science, a little dab will take you away from God thinking that you know so much. He says a lot of science brings him back. When we begin to study science and the stars, and, and I have spent years studying these things to find out what I believe and, and to test the Bible. Yes, I've tested the Bible, and I've studied it from science and theology. And what I've realized is through all these studies is there is a God, and He preexists. He's the one that made all the stuff. And people argue how it was made, and I have opinions on how it was made. If you've got four hours after church, I'll stay and tell you how. How old the earth is, I have opinions about that too. But the big argument isn't all the hows. The big issue is this. Is matter eternal or is there a God? And that's what we're struggling with in our culture. In our culture right now, the belief, the secular belief is naturalism. All there is is this stuff. And we are beginning to see the fruits of that belief. With generations of people not knowing who they are and people wandering. And now even the cry for socialism, which will lead us to economic slavery, is all rooted in how we view God or how we don't view God. That all there is is this stuff. And now what's happening in our culture and older people, parents and grandparents, please hear me, postmodernism, the next generation. My wife and I just spent a, a three days in a seminar learning about Gen Z's. And people aren't getting, even the experts aren't quite getting it. I had some discussions like, you really got to look, like, look over here. Here's what's really happening. What's really happening today is that because we've had this belief system says naturalism all there is, that science is all there is, the world is all there is. Now we have a generation that are growing up postmodern. Postmodernism is, the, is, is anti-modernism. It's saying science is not filling the void. There's got to be more. That's the cry of postmodernism. And so we're beginning to see a group of people that are now sli are sliding now to different religions and ideologies because they're looking for something. This is an opportunity for the church. But we have to understand that if we don't give them the right vision, the right version of who God is, they're going to get slid into all these things. They'll go right back to where Israel was in Egypt, and it's going to lead to bondage. Now, you might not be hyped up about this, but folks, I'm seeing it and I'm believing God's calling us to address what's happening out in our world. That we have the answer, and the answer is to tell people who God is, not who we want them to be. There's things about God that I'm uncomfortable with. How about you? But when we declare who He is and He begins to show up, He begins to change how we view ourselves. He existed before all the stuff. That's the real debate today in our culture. Is there a God? Isn't there a God? Not how many old the earth is, though I have, like I said, there's arguments about those things and debates that are willing to be heard and need to be heard. But is there a God? Because if there isn't a God, what's the purpose of all this? Nothing has meaning. And God comes on the scene and he lets them know. God, here's what, scientists, have anybody ever heard of the Big Bang Theory? great TV show. In the beginning, God created the Big Bang Theory, the TV show. No. Up until the 1950s, science in America and throughout the world believed that matter was eternal. And then something really happened that really turned the world upside down. Some Catholic priest who was a scientist and studying these things Notice that light out in the galaxies is red shifted. Now, that doesn't mean anything to you, does it? But for scientists, it meant a lot. Because red shifted light means that it's moving away from us. And this, this guy began to postulate, wait, wait if, if the light is moving away from us, it means that our universe is expanding. 
And if our universe is expanding, it means at one point it was smaller. And out of that came the development of what we call the Big Bang Theory. And scientists resisted this theory for a long time because they knew what it meant. They knew that if you took the Big Bang Theory, which is scientifically verifiable, it's going to lead to Genesis 1. In the beginning. That there's a beginning. That this matter that we look at and touch is not eternal. It's not always been here. And it's the same thing that the Bible has been saying. All they really had to do is read the Bible. But you know, people don't want to read the Bible today. And so... They took 2,000 years of science to figure out what God had already said 4,000 years ago. David Berlinski quotes Nobel laureate Arno Penzias, who remarks, The best data we have concerning the Big Bang are exactly what I would have predicted had, nothing, had I had nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, and the Bible as a whole. Why is that important, folks? Because here's what God says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. I've spent probably 400 hours studying those two verses. Here's what those two verses say. There was nothing but God, and then He created everything. And notice in verse 2, the subject changes. The subject changes from God to the earth. And what God is saying is in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He created the primeval waters. He created all the stuff out of which everything that exists came from. And folks, it may not be a big deal for you, but it is a bigger deal for you than you realize. But it was certainly a big deal for Israel. And it's a big deal for our identity. You and I are not alone in the universe. You and I are not all there is. You and I are not on the top of the food chain. There is somebody else that existed before us and created us. He created all the stuff. Number two that you're going to learn from this book. Everybody shake your hands and get awake, okay? You ready? <laughs> Pastor Bob, I didn't want to come to a theology class. I didn't want to come to get a lecture. But you're going to get a lecture anyway. <laughs> all right? You need it. This will change your life. We are not alone. E.T. is not who we're looking for. We're looking for God. That's why SETI spends billion, has spent millions of dollars, maybe a billion dollars, looking for ways out in space, finding out who's out there. There is somebody out there. His name is God. I could save you a lot of money. He created all the stuff. Big deal. Because Israel was taught that all the stuff was there, and the God just kind of oozed out of it. Number two, Genesis 1, 3, verses 3 through 25 tell us that God organized the stuff. All you see in Genesis 3, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 3 through 25, and I'm not going to read all that to you, is God forming matter. He forms it the first three days. He forms mountains and oceans and and the sky and and all the things. He, He forms them on the first three days, and then the second three days he fills them. He organizes stuff. This would have been huge to Israel. It's not the gods who are behind everything. It's not the gods who organize everything. So we don't have to appease the gods. There's one God who made all this stuff, and he forms it, shapes it, and then he fills it. Because, you know, last time I checked, if you want to put water in a bucket, you have to have the bucket first. So he forms it. And people have argued and debated over all this stuff over the years. And I say, let them continue because you learn something from striving with it. But the big point is there is a God who predates all this stuff. And I'm going somewhere with this. And there is a God, one God, not many gods, who organize this stuff, which leads us to the third point in this chapter. Because I'm cutting out a lot because I can see the deer in the headlight look. Pastor Bob, you're much more excited about this than I am. I got a roast in the oven. And I'm glad that God created it, and He organized it. And you're going to be really glad about the third point I have to make. God made the stuff, all of it. He organized the stuff, and He filled it. He he created a place for us to live. He created all the stuff that we need, because the third point is this. God made all the stuff, and He organized all the stuff. 
and he gave all the stuff to us. All the stuff in the world was not made for God. It was not made for the gods. It was not made so that we could appease some God and give everything we have to some deity and cower in fear and make sure they're happy. God made the stuff for us. And Americans like their stuff. We like our stuff. I just told you two weeks ago, I just got some new stuff. Well, really, Patty got some new stuff. Silver, Silverado, four-wheel drive, glory to God. God made it, God organized it, and I get to drive that sucker. God wants you to have stuff. And we Americans, we like our stuff. We really do. Listen to these statistics. The average American home contains 300,000 items. Now, that's got to count the nails, the shingles. It's got to, because I don't know how they came with that. I, I doubt that number. That number, I really, but I'm quoting somebody else's statistic. So, I had Patty last week count. <laughs> I think she's on 25,116. But he didn't count the truck, because it's mine. The average American house has almost tripled in size over the past 50 years. We like our stuff. Of the world's children, 3.1% live in America, yet Americans purchase 40% of the toys sold in the world. Our kids like stuff. On average, American women have 30 outfits. I'm going to skip over this one. The figure was nine in 1930. Folks, we're blessed. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty because what I'm trying to tell you is God wants you to have stuff, but God wants the other nations of the world to have stuff. But we're heading a direction in our country that if we stay where we are, if we stay on the path we're on, the end result is all our stuff is going to go away. Cries are starting. Socialism will lead us to losing our stuff. And I'm not here to get political. I'm trying to get theological. I'm telling you the root of this is our understanding and how we view God. Is there a God or isn't there God? The irony is that once we begin to deny the existence of an invisible, transcendent God, we end up becoming slaves to stuff instead of stuff being slaves to us. And it all starts with how we view God. Is there a God or isn't there a God? Let me say more stuff. On average, American families spend $1,700 a year on clothes and dispose of 65 pounds of clothing. There are more TV sets than people in the average home. Glory to God, I want a 65, 70-incher. Hallelujah. Do you know how much better the sermons I watched look, Patty, when I have a 70-inch TV sitting in front of the thing, getting a tan from the light that's coming off of it? God made the stuff. That's what Genesis is telling us. Otherwise, stuff is just here. And what you'll find is if you look at the religions of the world, is slowly but surely, and we're creeping along the same way in America, is we begin to reject that there is a God that started all this stuff and created this stuff and organized this stuff. And we begin to slowly worship the stuff. And once we begin to worship the stuff, the stuff begins to make slaves out of us. We're not slaves. We're sons. We've got to begin to understand who we are. We're sons of the living God, daughters of the living God. He's talking to slaves. They came out of slavery. They had the mindset of slaves. They, they, they don't own anything. They are owned, and he's trying to get them to see, if you will worship me, if you'll make me your God, and you will follow me, I will make you have dominion. Watch what he says. He's gone all the way through this chapter. He's created all the stuff, all the stuff by which we can make trucks and cars out of. You realize they go into a mountain? They take out ore from the mountains. They take dirt. They fashion that dirt. They process that dirt. 
and out comes this silver Silverado. They go out into the mounds. They take dirt. They fashion it, or they go into the, now let me say this, they drill into the hole in the earth, and they bring out this old gooky stuff, this goo that's black and like tar, and it's called oil. And they make plastic out of it. And out of that plastic, they make 70-inch screen TVs. Oh, oh, oh. All that stuff comes from God. Every time you put gas in your truck or your car, you ought to say, thank you, Jesus, for the stuff. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty for having stuff. God rejoices in you having stuff. He created all the stuff. He organized it. He organized the world so that you and I could have a place to live. You and I could have all these things that we need. And he said, here, you manage the stuff. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. That's everything he just made. God made the sun, the moon, the stars. He made the earth so that we could have a place to live. He created all the animals, all the trees. He said, go for it. This is all your stuff. Now, why am I saying this? Christians, sometimes, we spend too many times dealing with fruits and symptoms. We've got to get back to the roots. You know, I, I, I've had back trouble. You've heard me talk about this for years. So I've decided I want, I've gotten to about 96% health. I can do almost everything that I've been able to do when I was younger, except I still have this one problem that is keeping me from being able to go out and run. Because when I run, my weight comes off, and I keep my weight in check, and I want to be able to run. And so I decided I'm going to do one more thing. I've been to chiropractors. I've been to doctors. I've read books. I've done all kinds of stuff. I, I, I've decided I'm going to go to this place called Healthy Back, and I'm, and I'm going to let them educate me. So, so I, I went in there, and they began to educate me about my back issues. And I can't remember why I'm going here. Maybe I should have gone to the memory care unit. <laughs> but it'll come to me. Relax. It'll come to me in a minute. But anyway, they're educating me about my back and they're, they're, they're showing me all these things that I can do. But I got to do them. And I was making an excuse. In fact, I was making an excuse to one of the girls and she said, Mr. Weed, do you want to get better or don't you? I said, don't you have a pill? Can't you give me a massage? Dominion. Basically, she didn't say it this way, but this is what she was saying. You have to have dominion over yourself, your body's even stuff. Take dominion. Our image of who we are. How you're going to live your life is going to flow out of whether you believe there's a God or not a God. And then, once you believe whether there is a God, what's He like? That'll determine how you live. Simple message is this. God is not against you having stuff. That's, the poverty gospel is not biblical, nor is the covetous gospel, where people teach you that life's all about stuff. What begins to happen when we begin to worship the one and true living God is we begin to get stuff in its right perspective. And then God begins to give you stuff, and then you take dominion over that stuff and use your stuff for your own needs, the glory of God, and to bless other people. Now, I didn't preach half what I got in my notes. You'd be here for another hour. But I'm saying all this to say this. Genesis 1 mentions creation, but it's really about the creator. Because our image of ourselves will flow out of that image of who we think God is. Which just means because God created the stuff, God organized the stuff, and God gave us the stuff. You know what that means about you? You are sacred. I started this message 
by quoting Time magazine that our vision of ourselves, our view of ourselves will be determined by our view of God. And then I talked a little bit of history about how as we are losing our image of God, how our value of human life is going down. We tend to think these things when we read them are disconnected. I'm telling you they're connected to how you look at yourself in the mirror. And the message, as we'll pick up on this next week, the message God is sending is, this is who I am. You can know who you are. And the message is this. God says, I am holy. There is no one like me. I am unique. There are no other gods. I'm the only one. I'm the only one in the room, and I'm special. And guess what? You are made in my image. You look like your daddy. You are holy. The point of this series is sacredness. We are losing the sacredness of life. And in that, we are losing the sacredness. When you look in the mirror, you need to start saying, t- say to your wife, next, I'm going to do that just this afternoon. I'm sacred. I'm holy. Treat me that way. And she should look back. I'm sacred. I'm holy. Go take a drive in your truck. <laughs> Our self-esteem will be determined by, stand with me as we close this up. Next week, I'm going to get into more helping us to get a better vision and image of ourselves. This stuff is so important. Your life will flow out from it. So I'm going to pick it up next week where we drop off. But I want you to close your eyes and as we prepare to bow your heads as we begin to exit the service. Father, there's so many things in this text that I have to really restrain myself to just not be like a fire hydrant and shoot it at your people. Lord, we've learned that sacred things belong to you. Now we're learning that we're sacred. That we're made in your image, special. We reflect who you are. And we'll take a deeper look at that next week. That sacred things, Lord, have a special use. We're sacred. We have a special use. The Bible says we're temples of the Holy Spirit. We're temples of the living God. You want to live inside of us. You want to do life with us. I don't quite fathom it mentally. I just know that it's true. And thirdly, Lord, holy things, sacred things have special instructions for use. And that's what the Bible is. It's instructions for sacred people how to live sacred lives so they can be sons and daughters and not slaves. Father, the enemy wants to enslave everybody in this building to something. And you want to free us. So, Lord, I ask you, help us to begin to get a more accurate view of who you are. A more accurate view of who we are in you. So that we can start living in freedom, sonship and dominion. Instead of bondage and tyranny and fear. Father, bless your people with freedom. In Jesus' name, and everybody said...